Um, I, we have now um, three discussions um, who are invited to uh, comment on the report and um, with a short statement of maximum five to ten minutes. Um, and uh, I would like first to introduce to you uh, Professor Jakob Reiner. Um, he is the director of the United Nations University in Bonn and the vice director of Europe of the United Nations University and the professor of the agricultural faculty at the University of Bonn. And he holds a PhD in theoretical physics, so he is the natural scientist <laughs> on the forum. Um, and uh, from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH in Zurich. Um, after his PhD, he first worked for 13 years um, in, in industrial research with ADB on superconductivity in electric networks and high voltage technologies for energy transformation. In 2001, he joined the Swiss Federal Institute for Snow and Avalanche Research, where he became head in 2006 and has worked on topics of avalanche warning systems, testing, and so on. Um, he is active in numerous uh, professional organizations and a member of the transition team for the Kate Initiative Future Earth. So I would like to invite you for your statement. So thank you very much. Uh, dear Heidi, dear colleagues, uh, as you have heard, I may be the only uh, hardcore natural scientist on the podium, so I thought I should defend natural science, but uh, I can't calm you down, Heidi, I fail when I try. Uh, when I uh, thought about what is happening in uh, the climate change or, or general global environmental change discussion, uh, one of the main statements you can read everywhere, and you can also uh, read at many places uh, in the uh, World Science Report, is that humankind is at an unprecedented situation with uh, quite sinister uh, perspectives. Uh, when I think about what is happening in science, maybe one should also say that science itself is in a kind of an unprecedented uh, stage with maybe not sinister uh, perspectives, but with kind of uh, a crisis situation. Uh, I have the suspicion that uh, science itself doesn't really know how to deal with the situation uh, uh, very well. Uh, let me just uh, focus on one uh, detail uh, in the whole discourse at the very, uh, very central part, uh, namely global warming. Uh, when you look at uh, where this discourse is coming from, uh, this is a very special thing actually. This is coming uh, from a theoretical prediction based on climate modeling. Now, uh, it may uh, not be generally known, but when you look back in, in science, uh, when it happens very rarely that science makes a theory-based prediction. Uh, you can go, for example, 100 years ago, uh, then you will find the work of Einstein who did beautiful predictions, very strange predictions, very counterintuitive things, and it took physicists several years uh, to check them, and they were beautifully uh, confirmed with a, a terrible degree of accuracy, actually, terribly in the sense of who. Uh, now, in climate predictions, uh, half the story is the same. We do a theory-based prediction. Uh, the, th the, the part with the confirmation, however, is very different. Uh, we have huge uncertainties, uh, the database uh, is not very comfortable. The only uh, part of the data which is comfortable is where uh, climate change is directly related to melting, uh, be it snow, permafrost, uh, Antarctic ice, glaciers, and so there we have good data-based evidence. Uh, when it comes to flooding and storms, uh, I would claim that there is basically no evidence we have. So, uh, what situation do we have? Uh, climate modeling tells us that uh, we're going right away into a catastrophe with business as usual. Uh, we have to do an extremely uh, uh, large effort. We are facing an extremely large challenge in terms of uh, transformation if we want to avoid it. But uh, it doesn't really uh, tell us what we should do in detail. Uh, it is very difficult actually to do, and I can tell it from my own experience, uh, experience in the, in the, in the uh, projects we have, 
uh, we're having uh, great difficulties if we, uh, with, with the present modeling, uh, try to do a reasonable risk management in any part of the world. The data and the predictions are simply not good enough. So, uh, natural sciences in this field, and it is just an example I could, I think, uh, tell other stories in, uh, in other parts of science, natural sciences is leaving us with a complete mess. We basically know where we should go. Uh, we should go to a low carbon future. So the general uh, goal uh, natural science tells us is quite clear. Uh, then we have quite robust ethical consideration. Uh, we should alleviate poverty. Uh, we should have an equitable society. And this is kind of give us, uh, giving us a rather uh, good uh, idea about the end state. But here uh, begins the second mess. No one, especially not natural sciences, gives us an idea on how to get there. And uh, I think uh, when we look at politics as well as science, uh, there is one thing we don't really like to talk about, and this is what I would call trade-offs. Uh, we know where to get, but the way to get, I mean, uh, we, we make often a very a tacit assumption that we can just improve every parameter at the same time. So uh, we can alleviate poverty at the same time, we can do sustainable agriculture, uh, we can get the economics and in every part of the world right at the same time. Uh, I'm afraid it's not true. So the way to uh, a sustainable, desirable end state will be paved uh, with trade-offs, and uh, of course, I had not, I didn't have the the time to uh, look at every line in the report. But I, uh, during my time uh, in this field, I have developed some paranoia. Actually, I sometimes just look for the words. Actually, and I, so I go to the find mode in the word documents. I was very glad to have a PDF. And I looked for trade-offs. Actually, I saw that they are actually mentioned at quite some uh, places. But uh, uh, in, a, in a second edition, I think even the, the, the World Social Science Report uh, could be more clear on it. Uh, what I wanted to say, however, and I will end up here, uh, with the question of how to get uh, to this desired end state, that natural sciences simply have no answers. It's simply not their subject. And I have great hopes, and uh, we see several good uh, parts, several good approaches and arguments. Uh, that science uh, will do the job. So I think it's a good result. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reiner. Um, and next, would like to ask Dr. Um, <coughs> Will social science do the job? <laughs> so you are a, a director and professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Change here at the SET. Um, and uh, you hold a PhD in sociology and um, <coughs> just finished your habilitation um, in social and development research earlier. Um, um, this year, last year? Yeah, yeah this year. Mm -hmm. um, you specialize on knowledge and development sociology, including the sociology of natural resources, <coughs> environmental sociology, and development of methods, innovation, creation, and diffusion processes. And in doing so, you put a lot of focus on the social construction <coughs> of social as well as our ecological environments um, and on the construction of knowledge societies um, and how this relates to innovation. Yeah, will the social sciences do the job? Um, <laughs> that's, uh, of course, a difficult question, and I, I, I would call for uh, caution. Um, we, of course, are looking at, at a problem where we need to have the interdisciplinary or the transdisciplinary team um, formed already right from the start. This is always a, a, a debate in our inter- and transdisciplinary projects. Have uh, the teams been formed already at the beginning when we formed the research question, or are certain components only being um, added 
at the end, but then asked to take care of the diffusion, then usually the diffusion is very difficult. <laughs> so, you know, if, if we now draw um, a parallel here to, to uh, living with global environmental change, of course, this means um, um, a, simi a very similar thing. But let me point to a few points in the in the report that, out of my perspective, are um, especially uh, worth pointing to, basically. The report um, mentions several tipping points, um, several tipping points of environmental change, of climatic changes. Um, and at the same time, of course, we are looking, or the world increasingly is also looking at um, different social, socio-political tipping points. Um, we are now thinking, I'm now thinking of the Ukraine, of Russia, uh, the Krim um, um, province. We can also think of Iraq, Syria developments or um, the spread of the Ebola virus, which also indicates how um, the increasing mobilities that we face, this increasing speed that change is progressing through, um, is also causing more and more risks to um, human life and basically challenges our adaptive capacities on very many different levels and in different um, um, sectors of, of society. And then the usual narrative, and we also have um, pointed us to already, Heide, is then to, in order to deal with these changes, um, we require behavioral change and this worldwide and very focused and quite a sort of, but linear manner. Um, we basically would require behavioral tipping points. This is, yeah, that we would need to re reach tipping points where behavior of so many people has changed to such a degree that everyone is, else is also pulled along. Well, this sounds very attractive, but I, in my view, is quite um, unlikely. Um, and it brings us to the problem that behavioral change theories do focus at the individual level still, um, mainly looking at, well, there are different, of course, behavioral change theories, but a strong point um, is made for education huh, and the role of education in order to, to shape our own um, choices that we make in the behavior that we then employ. Um, but we need to, we cannot answer questions of global environmental change by remaining on the individual level. And that then of course brings us, and also here in, in the research itself, to the, govern, to the level of, um, of collective governance. Um, here we then very quickly discuss uh, formal and informal governance um, patterns, patterns of decision making, um, of um, the shaping of rules that guide guide us in everyday life. Well, the focus often, and I also found that in the report, is um, put on the formal governance um, um, systems, so basically focusing on um, the state level, on international corporations, on um, the shaping and co-shaping of policies um, that can then again uh, are hoped to create pro-climate incentive schemes. This is um, one way to approach it. The problem here is that in many societies that we work in, in the global south, these formal governance schemes do not, um, do not actually guide everyday life to such a degree um, <coughs> that uh, we would target this everyday life and the social practices by them, but instead informal or what is often called informal governance mechanisms are a lot more relevant. So basically, um, yeah, community level social organization, um, forms of social organization or clan level, um, on the clan level or on the family level, no? different community level organizations. And then, if you then take this into account, because these informal governance systems are a lot harder for us to to, to work with, yeah? how, how can then change be infused, which is um, part of one of the points of the, or the aims of the World Social Science Report, um, that makes it of course then um, a difficult, difficult, difficult question that we answer then again by moving down to the individual level um, 
here at SET, we um, answered by employing various uh, types of capacity development on the individual level, just as much on the institutional level. But again, even on the institutional level, it is still very punctual, yeah? very um, tight in the end that uh, what we can achieve. So a second, a second point that, um, a second topic that we have to look at and are increasingly looking at are then social mobilization processes. Now, if we cannot um, change behavior, behavior globally through um, behavioral change theoretical approaches or simply through governance approaches, well then how else? And one approach here is looking at social mobilization um, processes and the, the People's Climate March in September in New York was here um, an important event no, to, to, um, to uh, not only symbolize um, the need for mobilizing um, the collective basically, but also to act as, um, as a guiding lamp in the end, no, as a, um, to communicate a vision for a different world, a world in which we can cope with environmental changes. And this is um, the third point, this importance for us to make actually sense of environmental change in many, many different um, uh, local contexts. The report points us to it. Um, for this, to make sense means also that um, we, we um, understand or we break environmental changes down to what what uh, these changes mean in different local contexts and for different um, societal groups um, and therefore create meaning you know, um, with regard to this. One out of my perspective um, major problem here is, and this is my last point, um, is that we are still not uh, moving in a sphere where we would have a global epistemic sphere for creating this sense from, or for making sense um, of climate change, you know? but we are still very much discussing in different uh, contexts of knowledge production and knowledge sharing and make sense of these environmental changes in very um, different ways. I'm not saying we need to make sense of it in one and the same way, but we need to be able to communicate the different ways of making sense of environmental change in order to then also move towards what is often called transformative science, yeah? science that push, that, that actually contributes to um, not only making sense, but then also action. Um, and this is the that we will have to work on. Thank you. Systems and resilience, as well as on the trans locality and migration regimes between South Africa and Europe. Geographic focus is on Eastern Africa, on the nine countries, Southern Africa, and South Korea. So we are looking forward to your perspectives and on the questions on the report. Thank you. First of all, I, I would like to extend my, my congratulations to this report. It was really impressive. And luckily, when I when I downloaded the report, I did not immediately press the print out <laughs> because this would have wasted uh, I don't know half a dozen trees in the tropics. And so, so um, and and I think um, probably all of us uh, in this room would agree to at least ninety-seven percent. That is on what you have to 
and we nowadays when you talk about climate change, 97% um, of what you're writing in the report. And in what I'm going to say now in the coming nine minutes, I would like to concentrate on the remaining 3%. Um, the, uh, um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm asking myself, what's new in this report? Why did you need 600 pages uh, to uh, say things in which we all believe, in which uh, most of um, the critical community of people who are researching environmental change um, do believe? This is, I, I would say much of it is common sense among social scientists. So do you really have to... Um, to convince people to give in to um, these new ideas. I, I leave this as an open question um, to you. Just going back to the Brundtland report, for example, I've just read it in 1987. I mean, where is the, the advancement of uh, social science in that point? The second thing that I find very interesting in your report is that uh, there's a lot about the relationship between sciences. And as a geographer, I'm, I, I feel a lot of sympathy for that problem that you're uh, tackling here because I'm, I, um, I always have this impression that I'm, I'm on the wrong side. Whenever you talk to a natural scientist, they see me as a social mm -hmm. scientist and vice versa. <laughs> so the anthropologists uh, say, well, I'm not really a, a true anthropologist. I don't know what's going on in local communities. So it has a lot to do uh, with communication between sciences. And here, um, you don't say that, but there is something that goes through the debate, something like uh, that people often make others believe that there is a conspiracy on the other side. Um, I have made a lot of negative experiences in cooperation with natural sciences. I've wasted a lot of time in big projects, although they generated a lot of research money. Um, but the outcome of the debate between the natural sciences and social sciences not, was often not very convincing, but not because there's something like a conspiracy, but simply because the natural science, scientists didn't care for what I was doing. Um, and they, they, uh, they said, well, it's nice questions you are asking, but who cares? Um, we are having our own models, so um, uh, I think that, that is a problem that we have to deal with, how to talk to other disciplines and make them convince them that what we are doing in the other uh, direction of research is relevant for what they are doing. The third uh, point I find interesting in uh, the report is that um, what you're urging for is, is pretty much going into applied research. So um, you're asking, the, there's always this so what question going through everything. For me, as a German uh, social scientist, this is a very uh, Anglo-Saxon question. Because for me, and I'm, I'm very happy to be at a German university, I do not always have to ask the so what question, but first of all, I have to understand what is going on. And this is the question I'm missing. Um, so the report is not very analytical. Uh, saying analytical, I mean what I'm really missing in the report is that you're not referring to social theory. We, we do have theories that are able to explain what is happening in the world. So, I mean, all this, what we have under, under the headline of um, political ecology, for example, where is that in the report? Why didn't the people, the authors who are contributing to the report did not refer to the theories that help us explain some of the problems that you, have, that you are dealing with in the report? Um, a fourth, um, well, I'm, I have to summarize a bit. A fourth point that I find uh, very uh, important and interesting is if I look at the report as, as something like a, a self assuring process among social scientists. So, um, somehow I'm exaggerating. It's these poor social scientists in, being put in a corner. There's this big natural science research going on on climate change and all that. And then we are complaining, oh, we also need more money and nobody listens to us and things like that. I think this is, it's a good strategy, actually, to say, well, uh, we are important and you don't listen uh, to us uh, sufficiently. And I would, I would understand this, um, this process that I, that I read out of the report as a process of building a paradigm. Um, I think this is necessary, uh, to develop a paradigm of social theory-based uh, understanding of uh, global environmental change. This is necessary as a strategy, but I don't see it for the time being. It is, uh, if you follow uh, Thomas Kuhn's um, 
a history of science um, of 1962, I think. Um, one way of, of defining a paradigm would be that uh, we say it's, it's some of a shared uh, a bundle of assumptions and beliefs among scientists. That is certainly true for all these 150 authors of the report. But what it lacks in social science, it means it also has to have some, some uh, um, joint theoretical background. And that is what I'm missing. And I think that is where we should go in this kind of research. Well, um, all the rest, uh, I said um, 3%, I only covered 1%, <laughs> um, I think in the, in the next round. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. that you may actually right away come around the table as well as all the other uh, discussions and presenters um, and have you sit there and I will just take this chair and um, so I think I would like first to give Heide um, briefly the opportunity to react to some of um, the statements that have already been made uh, before we enter into a uh, more comprehensive panel discussion. And, uh, but I will also keep that limited in time in order to give you all the opportunity to raise your questions. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'll just pick up on one or two points. Um, but let me thank the panelists and do invite them as well to do the other 2%, you know, for the blog. <laughs> Work with us. These were great comments from all of you. Um, Jakob, I would say, you know, one of the points for me that you raised that I am critical of the social sciences is our lack of engaging in building credible alternative visions for what the future might look like. I find there's not enough social science work on that and I just last week I was in um, in London and had a meeting with uh, Tony Giddens who you know who does that kind of big picture thinking and it was exciting um, to hear him talk about you know what sort of his vision of what societies could look like and it made me really think that this is a project we need to pick up on um, I think our capacity of our literacy to envisage alternative feasible mm. futures needs to be developed in the social sciences. Mm. Um, and I, I would say that goes also to your comments, um, you mm. know, on can the social sciences do the job? Well, I think your comment about this is a joint undertaking is important. And what has changed in that, that we are taking seriously what joint means. So the idea that social sciences no longer are seen as coming in at the end of the process to sell the solutions of other disciplines, but rather that social scientists bring fundamental questions that need to be uh, used to frame the problems in the beginning. I think that's a very important point um, that we need to understand. And I think your point about not having the global epistemic sphere where we need to compare and um, communicate results is partially what our program wants to yeah. do, so very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the 3%, 1% disagreement. I thought there were some fantastic points there. Um, so what's new? For me, what's new is that we are trying to articulate very clearly a framework of fundamental social science questions that can be used to frame. And it's, it's not so new for the social science community, but it's new for the natural science community to say, ah, oh, this is why we need to talk to you before we go and design the projects. That's one, and I mean it new not only in terms of what we see in terms of knowledge production, but new in terms of how, at a policy level, we've been engaging with natural sciences. When Future Earth started three years ago, the first discussions about visioning global environmental change for the coming decade, this is anecdotal, but it's a serious story. I went to the International Council for Science and said, you cannot do this without the social sciences. 
and I eventually persuaded Iksu to invite me as an observer in my personal capacity. This is four years ago. There's a sense of the distance between the communities. And the work we had to do in the interim was to persuade them and articulate a clear framework of what it is that we bring. And that's the political job of the report. Even though it is common sense to a lot of people who work in this field, it, you know, there was a political dimension to that. I'm happy to say today we're co-chairing the alliance, so you know, we've kind of won those relations of trust. But it is a relation of trust, um, and it's one that you can't impose. It's one that has to emerge, and it has to emerge from showing what communities bring to the joint framing of problems, I think. Um, I, I do, where I do object and where I'd love to have a longer debate with you about is that, that solution, the call for solutions orientation is the same as doing applied research. I think we've moved away from the old dichotomies of theoretical, empirical, applied, basic and that solutions-oriented research, if, if understood in transdisciplinary um, terms, is about um, both theoretical, empirical, basic, and applied. It's about bringing parts, different pieces of the puzzle into a common knowledge arena um, and to networks of mutual learning, which involve different types of knowledge actors and um, you know, we have to accept that as academics, we are also producers, but as also users of knowledge. Um, so I would, would love to have a discussion with you about that. And finally, the development of a new paradigm, I think that's a very interesting challenge that you pose. And I would want to ask, is it a paradigm that we need to develop for the social sciences and possibly humanities, or is it an integrated paradigm that we need to develop? Again, I think it's something we need to think through critically. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, I think we, we should pick up on these last two um, issues also here in the, in the broader panel. And um, I just wanted to reiterate that, that the report does um, state um, that, I mean, you're pushing, <laughs> I would say, the, the social science in a more proactive role. Um, you are asking for social innovations um, to be initiated by, by social scientists. You are asking for better governance approaches. And um, yeah, my question to the panel is, can we do this? Um, um, what can social science do? Where are maybe also limits of social science? And how do we need to do it? What is the role of theory in this, what is um, the role of empirical research in this, and, and um, yeah, is there a tension between applied research and, and uh, more theoretical work, or um, um, can this be interpreted in a different way? So I don't know who would like to go first on, on this topic. Okay, we'll start with Professor Reiner. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just looked for a microphone. <laughs> so, yeah, well, see, I, I look at this again from a, from a very practical point of view, not from applied or so, but from a very practical point of view. Just going back, and I take again uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the special case of, of, of climate change. When we go back uh, 20 years, actually, uh, we had the discussion among scientists, among natural scientists, and I remember very well some talks I've heard about the question, is there climate change or not? The question was not settled uh, 20 years before. But then uh, uh, quite soon we, we, uh, we, we actually uh, gathered enough data to say, yes, there is climate change. Now, I think we have made a huge uh, way since then. Uh, in these last 20 years, actually, there have been very, very strong, uh, I don't say powerful, I will come to this uh, later, but very strong mechanism in place. Uh, huge money is invested, for example, to the, uh, to the climate change negotiations. So a huge secretariat has been formed in... in, in, in uh, uh, in, in UN uh, across the street, many things are across the street here. Uh, IPCC, <laughs> which I think is a kind of a, of a new paradigm of, of translating, so to say, global science efforts into practice, whether it is uh, 
uh, successful or not, I, uh, it would be a separate discussion, but I think it, it's huge efforts we have made. Now, when we are looking at what comes out, so uh, the, the way we are coming in terms of real results, in, in terms of climate change mitigation, I don't say uh, these negotiations have failed. Uh, I can't say it as a, as a UN staff. But uh, I, I think we certainly have not come uh, even a percent along the way uh, which we should come. And uh, I think, honestly, we don't really know very well uh, how to go further along the way. We all hope that we will have a good result in, in, in Paris. But I think the current negotiation mechanisms and the current nego uh, consensus building mechanisms uh, are probably uh, not leading us much further. And we need someone to help. And this can't be done by natural scientists. So I have a very pragmatic, uh, so to say, uh, request to social or political, maybe also historical sciences. Uh, humankind has undergone uh, many transformations. Many behavioral changes have, have taken place. I'm not a specialist in these things. But uh, I, I would, I would uh, really like to ask uh, social science, political science, to go beyond understanding the processes. Detlef, you have said that political ecology theory helps us to understand many things, but we have to transfer them uh, into practice. And this is really not, uh, I think, uh, social sociology uh, wouldn't have to be as modest as saying, let's try to reframe things uh, in a sociological problem. I think you could, you could be much more bold and say, hey, let's try to solve the problems we have. Natural sciences can't alone. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the, I think partly we're, what we are also partly discussing here is this whole division between applied and basic and that this is actually defined differently in the social sciences and the natural sciences yeah um, so when you are saying well but the social sciences why don't you solve the problem many social sciences would say scientists would say well because we, we are not PR agencies or we are not you know, implementing agencies. Or, so basically there the step into practice is not really part, is regarded as part of, of the social science in itself. Yeah? And this is where the movement comes in into sustainability science, transformative science, mm -hmm. basically jointly formulating the research mm -hmm. questions and then pushing them, implementing, and um, as part of implementing also building the capacities to then later on take different decisions. No? But this is of course taking time. So yeah. you mentioned I IPCC, one could think of the SDG debates. These are all platforms of learning, but we are running out of time. So yes, who can do the job? The social scientists, maybe, but um, that would have to require quite some redefining redefi and re um, shaping of the social sciences themselves, in my view. So. Okay. Yeah. You are a social scientist, aren't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, my heart is for the social sciences. Uh, um, although uh, the anthropologists don't believe that I'm a social scientist. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the key uh, issue I would see is how to uh, develop an integrated paradigm of global environmental change and to, to, um, uh, to look for an embeddedness in existing and, and, and already uh, tested a social theory. And I do believe this is possible, but although we do not yet have it. The problem that I do see here is that um, so far, also if I look at, at most of the, uh, uh, the papers in the report, um, uh, integration still is more or less stuck in an additive um, approach. So uh, social ecology does not necessarily mean that um, we are studying uh, the ecology and the social side of the system with the same methods, but these are two different methods, and, and I do believe we, we have to have different methods. The problem is how to integrate these two sides. Um, and I think that where we are right now, we, we are still too much stuck in a positivist um, approach where uh, human behavior is still more or less explained as a reaction to changing climates or whatever. This, this leads nowhere. 
Um, so um, adaptation to climate change is not a response to temperatures, but it is much more complicated, as we all know. Another very important point I would like to make is that we all are aware that knowledge that n does not necessarily translate into action. Um, but what we have to acknowledge is interests, is power, yeah. is hegemony, um, and, and a disbalance of hegemony uh, in <coughs> order to explain why some <coughs> action is taken and some action despite better knowledge is not taken. And that is what I am urging for, to integrate that into um, the development of, of an integrated um, paradigm that links uh, studies on the natural science side of global environmental change and a societal perspective. Yeah. I think that last point is, I mean, very important is the question of do we need more knowledge? Or, you know, do we, is, is this now about how we utilize knowledge and, mm -hmm. and how we sort out issues <coughs> of power, interests, and, and competing values? Um, the idea also of, you know, can, so for, I think an interesting question is not can social science help us, but can science save us? Or is this a broader societal joint effort that we're talking about? And I think that's why in Future Earth we're pushing the kind of transdisciplinary co-design, co-production processes so much as a recognition that science is part of a puzzle, as part of a broader package of ingredients that we now need. Um, so it's not just about you know, new knowledge production, it's about exi using existing knowledge but also recognizing that there is knowledge beyond the scientific community that is equally valid and that needs to be part of, of what we bring in. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually this <laughs> pushes me directly into my uh, second round of, of questions or maybe two interlinked questions. Um, uh, the report does very heavily advertise for interdisciplinary research. You call uh, upon social scientists to re lead um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research projects, um, yeah, to initiate them, to lead them, to um, not to be the appendix, um, uh, but, but to, to frame the, the problem and to, to be, and to engage in, in uh, co design, co-production, and co-dissemination, um, uh, um, meaning to engage with policymakers, um, practitioners in the society, private sector, etc., um, in a transdisciplinary knowledge production. And I think, um, um, as far as I can see, all uh, panelists do have experience with interdisciplinary and, and transdisciplinary projects. and that if you already mentioned it some uh, in, your, in your previous statement. Um, so I would like to ask you again, um, um, what are your experiences? How do we need to take this forward? Can the social sciences lead on these projects? Um, and what do, I mean, how do we need, can we do it? How do we need to do it? And, and um, um, what lessons do we have to learn from previous experiences in doing it? And this time I would like to start with this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, well, as I already said, um, I've wasted a lot of time in cooperation with natural scientists, uh, although they helped me to earn research money. Um, and just to give you an example, that was a, there was a project here in Bonn and Cologne on uh, water-related issues. We had a lot of money, which was nice. Um, and the only question the meteorologists wanted to know from me and my group in the end was, how much water does an average Moroccan consume uh, per year and how many Moroccans are living per square kilometer so they could put that into their model. So I was completely useless in the project because I was, I was dealing with different questions. I, I fully subscribe to what somebody said before that uh, in order to really come to a joint research, uh, the questions have to be formulated together between natural scientists and... and uh, a social scientist, and that would be a completely different type of project. That's one thing. The second thing where I see a challenge is that social scientists have a difficulty to really join the, the language of modeling. This is, this is apparently um, yeah. the, the, the integrative language of, of natural scientists. I don't like it, I must, I must <laughs> admit. 
Uh, and still, I, I, I think this is on our side of the natural scientists that we have to go a step in the other direction and, and given to, to advanced types of modeling. And I think there's still quite a way to go. Anna Katharina. Yeah, I mean, we work here in um, all these big interdisciplinary projects uh, financed by the German taxpayer in the end. Um, and we, I would say we have come actually quite a long way. I'm now with the institute since eight years and um, we are by now in, involving our potential stakeholders, potential end users in formulating research questions if it is possible, but there of course you have sort of the, the um, egg and hen question, if that exists in English, this description. Uh, um, who do you involve as a stakeholder when you don't know the research question yet? Depending on who you involve, that also co-shapes of course then the research question. So it's not, not an easy process. In the end, um, getting better at inter but also transdisciplinary research and I would really push us to if we want to actually leave the, the, the sphere of science and push for actual change we need to employ far more transdisciplinary methods than only interdisciplinary methods but um, if we uh, if we want to, to push for that well yes we need to involve these stakeholders right from the beginning um, but of course then the research projects themselves become quite different too in, in overall style and then if you do that then the social sciences need to be uh, le leading or at least being one of the maybe not leading as the one leader but being co-leaders <coughs> basically in the projects in order to channel all discussion processes but whether these in the end, maybe one more point, um, we've gotten a lot better because um, people are getting socialized into, into inter- and transdisciplinary research approaches. And I do think it is a way we need to socialize um, PhD students in, and researchers, young researchers, into this ability to communicate across the different boundaries. Um, of course, we work here with different approaches, the boundary crossing framework from Molenkra, Peter Molenkra, um, as one example in order to structure our inter- and transdisciplinary interaction processes. It has pushed us further, but I do still believe that the capacity development that is actually taking part as part of the projects is actually the, the most relevant part for, for making sure that it is put into action, no? that the knowledge is also put into action. So maybe just this. Mm. Yeah, I think we are, it's, it's, it's a part of the reality, unfortunately, that uh, natural and social scientists still, uh, to some extent, have the feeling that they are wasting time with each other. And uh, I think we have, to, uh, we have to come across. So, uh, but, and I think there, there, is a, there is an easy and straightforward way to come across, and I would like to be a bit provocative. I think if we are uh, having the feeling that we are wasting time with each other, then we are both uh, natural and social scientists losing ground. And we are losing ground against uh, debates that are dealing with, uh, with the real concerns of, uh, of, of humanity, if I may be a bit pathetic. Uh, the way to overcome it, I think, is to really couple to reality in, se in the sense uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a term that is used a lot in the social science uh, report, uh, in, the, in the sense of co-designing. Now, I would like to be a bit provocative what this may mean. I think it means that we are a scientists crossing uh, at least three red lines which we don't like to cross. Uh, the first uh, is about the framing, about the, the theme framing, and here I think uh, we come into conflict with academic freedom. Uh, real co-design means that we are not defining the relevant themes ourselves alone without practice, that, that we uh, let practice really interfere in saying what is relevant and what not uh, in the sense of, of research. This is the first red line. Uh, 
Uh, the second red line is that uh, I think science needs to involve itself into political decision processes, not in the sense of uh, finally making the processes themselves, but in, in, in really supporting uh, the decision makers about discussing scenarios, uh, even giving opinions about what scenarios would be the better one. It's something uh, uh, science normally says, no, we don't, we don't want to do it. We provide the data, put it on this side of the table, then someone takes it over and makes use of it. Uh, the third thing is about implementation. Implementation, uh, where scientists, I think, uh, should involve, is uh, in many cases boring in terms of science. It is not the interesting part. We need, uh, if we really want to build up trust with practice, uh, we need to do many things beyond science. We need to help uh, uh, scientists uh, uh, to practice uh, at the point where uh, we are going to beyond science, where it is clear from science, we have solved and understood the problems, uh, but we still need to help. Uh, this is a big problem for young, non-established scientists because it is not rewarded uh, mm -hmm. by, by scientific and, and funding systems. But this, I think, are, are three lines uh, where we should cross each other. And uh, then, uh, as social and natural scientists, we will uh, meet at points where I'm quite confident that, that we don't have the feeling that we are wasting time with each other, <laughs> where, we are, where it becomes really important. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I, I would like to make two points, one on picking up on this notion of wasting each other's time, but also what you were mentioning about modeling makes me think about, you know, the whole big thing now, one of the big issues in science, of course, is, the, is, is big data. And one of the dangers, the real dangers for social science, I think, is that there is, there is you know, if you look at census data, etc., there's so much data about the so-called social where a lot of people think, who needs a social scientist? Here's the data. Let's just use it. And so what does it mean to be, who's a social scientist today? Oh, these are, you know, these are, I think, critical questions that speak to the relationships between the fields and that we need to sort out quickly. I have seen, personally, modelers who just reap social science data and bring it into their modeling and think they can model the universe <coughs> and the world and don't realize that data does not mean anything, we create meaning, you know. So those are, those are important issues, I think. On co-design, I've been involved in these processes for a long time, and so a couple of points about that. First of all, we've got to recognize that as social scientists and natural scientists, any scientist is not trained to have the skills to run transdisciplinary co-design processes. There are they are highly politicized processes and even if we get the architecture of those processes right and we get the right stakeholders in, engaged, which in itself can be difficult to know who are the right stakeholders, we don't know how we secure voice for them because there's always, these things are never neutral in terms of power and interest. Mm -hmm. So even when you have, I've been in processes where we've had the right NGOs and squatter settle movement leaders in the room, but they feel they don't have voice because there have been other more powerful actors in the room. So these are complex processes that we as researchers are not trained to facilitate. That's problem number one. Um, the second thing is that in order to develop those skills, we need to know as researchers that we've got safe spaces where we can practice and, and, and work with these kinds of processes. And funders, don't, and universities don't provide those safe spaces and resources necessarily. That's problem number two. The third problem is that I think we're in danger of assuming that as long as we do transdisciplinarity <coughs> with as many stakeholders as we can, we will find solutions. We've got to monitor and evaluate that. Mm -hmm. We've got to understand, does transdisciplinarity lead to the kinds of solutions that mm -hmm. we want? That's why we want in our program when we fund people to go and do transdisciplinary social transformations research to bring them together once a year to say is it working isn't it because we can't take for granted that it is <coughs> we know from other domains of research particularly in public health research um, that it can be extremely useful but i think in the sustainability research field we're still 
needing to monitor <coughs> and evaluate where these processes go. That, those are work. That's work for you know for the international organisations, for funders, for for, for research managers to also keep track of.